I'm not going to say we're live this week because I notice I say that we're live on every video. So I'm not going to say that here we are live today. <laughs> no. So, so, uh, but it is good to be alive. So I did say it, didn't I? It's actually good to be living out of the spirit. That's what that's what alive is to me. Is we're we're uh, we're alive to some things that's really helping us. I was up early this morning while most of you guys were sleeping and snoring and just going over writing these this the notes and uh, just thinking about how sad it is, particularly when Kay started teaching this, that so many people just it just really shook them up. And I guess it's back. What, baby? Okay. Most of them, uh, you know, even back when Brother Garner started teaching what he was teaching, people just said, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And then come to this big paradigm shift that there's no such thing as uh, penal substitution. There are actually some ministries that really spoke out against her. But I think if they would, and that's why we want to get this book out quick, if they would sit and read it, it makes so much sense, you know, unless your your conscience is so seared with a sin consciousness and and that God is angry with us. And, and I don't believe a lot of them believe that because I know one of them that's always talking about the love of God, you know. But how can you talk about the love of God and then say, but he needs appeasement. He needs you to do something to satisfy him. And so we're not criticizing people whatsoever. You know, because I'm there's still more for us to learn. I'm sure there's people probably ahead of us that are saying, "When they're going to wake up?" Mm -hmm. I like to find them, <laughs> but I believe I believe we we have found uh, uh, tapped into our Holy Spirit, and we're learning these things. But I also believe, really, when you hear something uh, that's a new understanding or another layer of the onion, as Brother Garner, again, you shouldn't say that's wrong. You should say, "Explain it to me." Or let, can I can I read some of your notes? You know, sometimes people aren't audio; they don't they can't hear real well in their spirit. Sometimes they need to read. And some brother, brother Butch tells me he he does better uh, with audio with listening, and I fortunately do both. I but I do mainly audio. I really enjoy audio, but I do my own writing, so I don't read a lot of books, but I enjoy reading. And so this is a powerful, powerful uh, lesson to us. Today we're in, uh, this would be lesson 21, number 21, and we started chapter 7 last week. Uh, I left off, and I want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, I had some questions about me saying that the Bible is not the inspired word of God. And we saw the scripture where they added where it said all scripture is the, but it says all scripture inspired by God. There's a difference. All scripture inspired by God. But even so, uh, some of the scripture... Uh, is inspired to help us see the difference. In other words, when and what we're seeing in Paul's writings, the Apostle Paul's writings in Romans and in Hebrews, I believe some people say they don't know for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews, but I attribute it to the Apostle Paul. I believe firmly that it is. And what he was doing, he was talking to them about what they believed. You know, you've heard it, you know, this is what the Old Testament people write. He taught, he, he did that to show us the difference in what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And there was a major difference. And so we have mistakenly read the book of Hebrews and Romans and other places thinking that he's talking about the present condition of man today. And in my little bit of understanding, I've been saying for many years that the first seven or eight chapters of the book of Romans is him talking about what men did before the cross. And that's not who we are now. And so that's what he's trying to explain. So we're going to continue to do this. And one of the things that is not inspired by God is when men blame God for things. And that there's no shortage of that. And that's not inspired by God. It's not inspired by the love of God whatsoever. Because you can't love somebody uh, with the pure love that God is and then turn around and punish them and drag them through. As my pastor I grew up with said, drag them through a knot hole backwards. <laughs> you know. And that's not love. So we want to show you again in Hebrews chapter 10. And if you want to turn there to verse 26. And see how the writer was talking about the things that came as a result of their mythological belief systems. And it came as a result of even paganism that had crept into the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people and the Jewish systems. And even the writers 
in, in the New Testament, a lot of people begin to, did I forget to unlock that? I bet I did unlock that from the outside, inside on it. Uh, but it crept in to the point that it became a belief system, to the point that people believed that God was a God of, of punishment and a God of reward. And I would bet most of you could raise your hands up and say that you kind of believe that way most of your life, that there's a reward time and there's a punishment time. And we could sit here and say, well, uh, the reason I do so good in my life is because I did this, I paid my tithes, I worked in the church, and so God rewards me. But then every once in a while I mess up and I do something wrong, and then God punishes me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I ever believed that God up there was somewhere saying, punish me, but I believe the result of what I did was a punishment but I also believe that it did come from God. I didn't, I didn't believe it was just consequences only. But the, the truth of the matter is, I wasn't sure. And I bet you weren't either. Because I always heard about the love of God. And it just doesn't match up with that. So they carried these things uh, into the God. The, the true and living God. They carried that all over their understanding. Which they also believed to be a God of reward and punishment. And they, uh, the God never has been, our God has never been that type of God, ever. So in Hebrews chapter 10, we want to see how the Apostle Paul, because of uh, people's mythology, he re redefined judgment. You know, we always taught and believed that there was supposed to be a coming judgment, but then we believed that Jesus bore that judgment. One of the hard things is, is we... You know, and I told Kay the other day, I said, the more and more that I'm learning this from her and learning what the Lord has shown me, I mean, almost everything I've written has got to be just completely changed because, you know, I used to say and, and that, well, it wasn't Jesus on the cross, it was Adam because Adam needed to be punished. Adam needed to suffer all that. But now we understand that Adam did not need punishment. Adam brought that stuff on himself. Adam produced all that. So God never, ever pronounced a coming punishment. He said there will be consequences to what you do. And so what needed to happen on the cross is for Jesus to remove that which hindered man. And that was that, what I call the degenerate nature activity that they produced because of the consequences that they lived out of. But there never was a need for anyone to ever go to the cross. And I used to fight that, man. I would have fought you and said, no, no, no. The prophets prophesied that that was going to happen. And Jesus had to die on the cross. And there was never a need for that. There was never a need for me to do anything to try to get God to forgive me. I mean, isn't that the good news? Dang, did we waste a lot of years? <laughs> Don, I was discussing this today. I was following a couple that uh, had bicycles on the back of the car. And I said, wow, look, they're going to, get, they're going to go bike riding. They're going to go, you know, and I thought, I, and, and, we, and we don't want to, we don't take from our church life. I enjoyed my church life, but I'm telling you, I missed out on so much with my family because I thought I had to be in church every Sunday morning. It had to be every Wednesday night and every revival and church was our life and we enjoyed it, but I'm telling you, we missed out on a lot. My kids missed out on me saying, Hey, Sunday morning, let's all go to the lake. You know, let's do this or let's take the weekend and go do this or that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because we thought we were doing it for God. And we thought it was, well, you have to go to church. And like Donna said, well, why couldn't we took one Sunday off? But see, my mind said, no, no, we have to go to church. And it was just drilled into my head. So uh, Jesus, when we read of Jesus, uh, Jesus' exhortation, we see he did the same thing Paul said as far as redefining judgment. But Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, they said this, they said that. That's what Jesus was saying. But he said, but I say unto you. He said, Moses said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And, but I say, turn your cheek. You know, he, he, he's, he was redefining everything that the law said, just like the Apostle Paul was. But God gave Paul this revelation to where he could explain it even in more detail. And there again, we needed Paul, we needed John, because the people could not understand what Jesus was saying. Right? He told his disciples, I've been trying to share these most holy place things to you, these spiritual things to you, but you can't understand them right now because you're still very much carnal. You're still thinking of me as a carnal king. You're thinking, I'm coming to set up my kingdom right now. But he said, be, don't be fearful. I'm going to send you more teachers 
and they're going to teach you and lead you and guide you into the things of me, and they're going to help you. And yet, even though he did, then again, the mythology and the, the uh, traditions of men and the religion of men crept, crept in, the translations of scripture crept in, and kept us to the place where we're still been looking for an earthly king for over 2,000 years. People still want Jesus to come back. I, I went to see a customer the other day up North Edmond, and they begin to ask me, you know, I just say, are you sure you want to know? You know, what do you teach? And I'd give them a little bit to see how they would react, and they would want to, more, want to know more and more and more. And as we concluded, the last thing the gentleman asked me, he said, well, you do believe that Jesus is coming back and set up his kingdom here, don't you? You know, and that, that, that was a pivotal thing for him. And I just, just to help him, I just said yes. You know, I didn't know what else to say, but I believe Jesus has come back. It's Christ. What I think has come back is man and awareness of who they are. Yes. Jesus' work enabled us to realize who we are and know who our Father is and who he is to us. So if you'll look, at, we'll look, we read this already, but we'll read it again. And we'll go through the rest of these verses. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So once we hear the truth of the gospel and we... The word sin, we know, means to miss the mark, but it also means side slips. Mm -hmm. So if we do a side, he, he's just saying, if you mess up, after you receive the knowledge of the truth, and you know what Jesus has done, there is no more sacrifice for you. You don't have to sacrifice. That's what he's saying. And, and, I, and I know we've said this before, and I'll probably say it again today, but may I evangelet, evangelet, I can't even say that word. How do you say it? I'm sorry. I'm tired today. Evangelical preachers, <laughs> evangelical preachers, there it is, evangelical preachers get out there and they take this verse to scare people half to death and it produces great, great fear. Yes. And we, we shouldn't do that. This is a really good, a good scripture here that he's, if you mess up, you don't have to sacrifice. There, there is no more. That, that system's done away with. Jesus did away with that. And so when it says there's no more sacrifice for sins, oh, I should have read, well, then I don't have to sacrifice anything anymore. You know, but it doesn't mean that there's nothing can be done. I'm, I'm lost. I'm bound to hell forever, and I'm going to suffer. It means there's no more sacrifice. We don't have to sacrifice. And, and he was saying, I know that you're still going to mess up. I know that, you know, you don't quite understand all these things, and there's going to be things take place in your life that don't represent your true character. But nothing will separate you from God, and you don't have to go sacrifice anymore. You don't have to be a slave to that religious system. So we saw where Paul was explaining where that belief came from. It came from the Old Testament judicial system, which was a false system of sacrifice and offerings. We know in Jeremiah 7, God said, I never spoke to you concerning sacrifice when I brought your fathers out of Egypt. I didn't do that. And remember I told you about when David had had his affair with Bathsheba, he felt very guilty for that. You know, he suffered in his, in his uh, brain about that. And so he began to talk with God. He spent about an hour repenting, if you would, or just, but then he said, but if I would offer you sacrifices, but David said, but I know you don't want them. Now, how can an Old Testament dude like that know that? Because he knew the heart of the Father. He knew love. He definitely grew up in a sacrificial system. He saw sacrifice all the time. Mm -hmm. But he was a man after God's heart. And I think he tapped into God's heart and he understood the love of God. And so David was, uh, was raised there and he, he realized this and he realized that God only wanted love. And that's what God told him. He said, you, you hate your mother's brother. You sacrifice this stuff to me. And all I want you to do is love me and love one another. And love will change this entire world. He does not want sacrifice. I look at you in the, on the internet and I tell you, if you're in a fellowship that requires you to do anything to please God, that is mythology and it is not true. He's already pleased with you. Amen. Oh, but what about the verse that says, without faith it's impossible to please God? It doesn't say that. It says, without faith, it's impossible to agree with God. And so we've got to agree with God. So let's, let's carry on here. Let's look at, read verse 27 all the way to verse 31. It says, uh, but a certain fearful 
uh, looking for a judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. And the adversaries just means people. If you want to write that in your Bible, I give you permission to draw through that to people there. <laughs> Some people don't think they should write in their Bible, but we need to. Verse 28, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Verse 29, of how much sore punishment, and there's the key word is suppose you, right? That's a key word. You suppose this. This isn't true, but you're supposing this. Verse 29, how much more sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot of the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. Verse 30, for we know him that hath said, vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Now, is Paul saying that? Or is Paul saying, this is what you believe? That's what he's saying. But we've read it, the church world has read it, like it's Paul saying that to us today. And therefore, people are afraid of God. I mean, if yesterday, with this understanding, yesterday I ate ice cream. The day before, I ate ice cream. The day before, I wanted ice cream. And, and, and then all of a sudden, I was getting ready to die. And I believed this, that I would be very fearful, wouldn't you? And for those of you that's first watched, this is your first time to watch this, I only use ice cream. I don't talk about what the world calls sin. So... You know, I, I can say if Carl was mean to Ann all day long, <laughs> all day long, and he kicked his cow for kicking him yeah. and showed anger, <laughs> and then he has a heart attack or he has a stroke and he's thinking, I'm going to face God tomorrow. What do you think Carl would be done? Be repenting, apologizing, making sure everything's right. And by the way, he did kick his cow, but his cow kicked him first, right, Carl? <laughs> I think I would kick him too. So, so as, we, as we stated earlier in our lessons, you, you can read verse 27 through 32 without, you can't do that without reading uh, the other verses of, that we've talked about already. We, if, we, if we read these, but we don't realize the, the, the other verses prior to that, what he was saying there, then we create a con. It's a con. It's not real. And what we do today is we take the word out of context. Mm -hmm. Too many people take one verse and make a whole denomination out of it, mm -hmm. right? And so we do that and we don't do that. So what, what is taking place here is that Paul is going to redefine judgment. And guess who Paul's talking to in, in, uh, in this book? He's talking to believers, He's not, he's not talking to Jews and Gentiles like he did when he wrote to, the, to Galatia. He's talking to believers, Hebrew believers, who have believed in what Jesus did. And again, this is a transitional generation. And they're transitioning from an old mytho mythological, paganistic uh, belief system, which was called the Jewish system. They called it the law, right? And they added to the law. How many more laws were there besides the, tw uh, the Ten Commandments? There was hundreds, wasn't there, Donna? They had come up with like 600-something laws. That was man's perception, what a woman could do, what a man could do, what made you unclean, and all that stuff came from them. And so we, he, he redefines this, and he's talking to these people, and he's explaining the truth, and he's re he's, he said, these people believe in penal substitution. You believe... And penal substitution because your leaders, your teachers taught you that. And I say this all the time, and I still believe it. The majority of what people believe is what somebody else has taught them. Very few people, particularly in what's called the church world, believe something because they've studied themselves. Now, yes, I believe, Rod, you opened the Bible, and I believe we looked at the Bible, but we only saw it through the lens of our denomination, or our teaching, or our upbringing. A Baptist will see a Baptist version. A Pentecostal ver uh, will see a Pentecostal version. Vicki Russ is always telling me in the Lutheran church she never feared God at all because they never taught all that stuff. They just taught good things, you know, and, but still didn't go into the depth of it, but that was her version. So everybody sees through that lens. And so they believed in penal substitution. They believed God had to be appeased every time they, quote, sinned or missed the mark willingly or willfully or ignorantly. 
that God required blood from an animal or required you to do something. So Paul's redefining judgment for them and what it really means. So at the onset of the book of Hebrews, he reveals to these people that Jesus is greater than the Old Testament priesthood. You've heard me say this before. We talked a few weeks ago about much more. But he's greater than the Old Testament priesthood. He's, he's greater than Moses. He was greater than their, their law. You know, he was greater than their feasts. You know, there was a time that God said, the, your feasts, because they were not God's feasts. And he said, these are your feasts. Jesus is greater than Joshua. Jesus is greater than messengers. The Bible calls them angels, but they're messengers. And, and any of the Old Testament prophets explain all that right before this section of Hebrews chapter 11. So that's why we shouldn't take things out of context. We need to read the whole book. We need to understand what he's saying. So what we must realize is Paul's not trying to take away their hope. He's trying to give them hope. Their hope was in their sacrifices. Can you imagine living under that? That your hope was if you brought the right animal and it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, spotted, it didn't have a hump back in it, or, or I, you didn't have a hump back as a priest. There was all kinds of stuff that it couldn't be. It had to be just the way they told you, <clears throat> and that was your hope. So he, he is giving them real hope. He's taken away false hope. He's taken away and your hope that if I can give enough money, God will bless me. Or if I can serve in the church or, or whatever it was. And I'm telling you, I could write a list of things that I believe that I needed to do to be blessed. I really did. And most of the time it was just so my pastor would be pleased with me. <clears throat> so, much like man today is afflicted by the various religions uh, of this earth being influenced by mythological belief systems, man today still teaches people to do this, to get that. And uh, Dudley Hall calls it the do to be tree. And most, most religious systems are taught from tree ministries that keep your eyes shut, your spiritual eyes shut. Because as long as you're trying to do something to please God, you're not seeing anything spiritually whatsoever. You're not awake. You're dead. You're dead in Christ. You're not awake. And so we want to wake people up. So remember Jesus told them, that uh, they, they couldn't understand these things, but, but there's this teachers that's going to come and they're going to explain you to these things. Your spirit is being reanimated, as Kay calls it reanimated. I call it revitalized. I call it push forward. The spirit was there, but it lay dormant in man. And so he, he's explaining that you're going to understand these things. And here's what, what we, what we want to grasp. The intention of the Apostle Paul, again, was to expose to expose the false sacrificial system. So as you read his writings now, you can see most of that was to expose the lie. And what have I been saying for a long time? We've been the children of the great lie. And Father has used me to expose that in partly in all five realms of life. And there needs to be more people doing that. I happen to believe that there are people involved in the medical industry that's exposing the lie. I've seen videos from a different, uh, I think one of them was John Hopkins Institute and some other ones exposing the lie about the nutrition that we've been taught to eat and how we're to go on low fat diets and, and eat more carbs and then they've ex they're exposing the lie about the sugar intake that we have. There are people that are exposing the lie about the financial institutions, Wall Street and all, all of it. The, and, the, and the big lie of pharmaceutical drugs that were taken into our body. So don't we need the, the lie needs to be exposed to? But the problem is that we still want, we want it. We like it. We've been taught that that stuff tastes good. You know, we've been taught that sugar's good for us. You know, Rod, I, I try my best to get off of uh, that, what's the pink sugar, artificial sugar? Sweet and low. I, I try, but I tell you, I've, I've put it in my sugar for so long, and I only put a little bit, you know, a half of it. But I know it's not good for me. It's chemical. But when I drink my tea, it's like I crave it. It just doesn't taste good without it. And I, that's just a little simple example of all the other stuff that we've been given. You know, my doctor told me the other day, my uh, orthopedic surgeon, he said, I don't see how you function, Roy, without taking some, time, some kind of anti-inflammatory. You know, they're always wanting to put me in arthritis medicine. And it would be easy to do it. If it would make my joints feel better, I would, you know, my, in my mind... 
But I know what it did to my mama's uh, uh, kidneys. I know what it does to other people. I see all the side effects of the stuff. And I would just rather, I'm just going to endure the pain until the pain leaves. And I, I, I see myself walking without. I'm not trying to get you to feel sorry for me. But I'm just telling you, it's all out there. And it's so hard to say, no, you're not my supply. You're not my source. God is my peace. God is my joy. God, God is greater than anything. And what Jesus did is greater than anything. So we want to expose the mythology. We want to expose the falsehood. We want to expose the old cultic bloody sacrificial system. You remember the Bible says that he took away the first to establish the last. He took away the first estate of man that they had fallen to to establish the last, which is Christ the new man. And we are established. We are Christ the new man. The only thing that we're waiting for is for uh, the earth, the, the, the Christ, the new man on the earth to wake up and show forth their glory. We already have the glory of God, don't we? We already are the glory of God. We're not waiting for the glory of God to come. So in review, the mythology idea of judgment was punitive, retributive, and vengeful. Punitive, retributive, and vengeful. God is love. He is not any of that whatsoever. The, the, the Western evangelical idea of judgment is you get what you deserve. And that's not true. You don't. You know, I've had people tell me all the time when my younger daughter, you need to let her fall on her butt. She deserves it. Well, I'm sorry. I love my daughter. You know, yesterday I rented a truck and helped move her stuff because I love her, because I want to help her. And it's just, it's just in me to do that. I can't be that kind of dad. You know, I'm not going to enable people to do, my children to do things wrong, you know. But I just, if I just think, I think about that all the time. That's the love of God in me. And my God's, his love for me, my father is, is greater than I could ever love anybody. And it is sad that we misrepresented our father. Very sad. Jesus didn't go to the cross because God needed something from us to satisfy us. He came to do it, an end to everything. So, conversely to the idea that religion has today, the Hebrew idea of judgment and justice is mercy, love, and grace. One thing if you, you can read in the Bible, I, I used to know how many, but several hundred places it says his mercy is forever and forever and forever. You know, it says his love endures forever, but they added the word endure. And I don't believe that meant the word endure to be strengthful. I think they meant that it endures us, Rod. You know, like you're not worthy of it. But when you, you look through there, it was all added. It just said, oh, give thanks to God for his mercy forever and forever and forever. What do you mean his mercy? Was he going to kill us? No, his mercy to me was he, 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 woke, he woke me up. His mercy it was that he sent it. He didn't leave us in the state that we were in. He didn't push there. It was, he wasn't taking us out of something we deserved. We were ignorantly there. We ignorantly believed the religious system. Adam ignorantly believed something and entered into self-condemnation. He believed what he did could separate him from God, and nothing can separate us from God whatsoever. So to me, his mercy was, I'm not leaving them in this state that they put themselves in. I'm bringing them out. See, if I don't love my daughter, and you know, then I would just say, well, just let her suffer the consequences, and she'll learn from it. Well, guess what? Consequences don't teach anybody anything, do they? Did they us financially, Donna? You know, we, we get a loan. You know, the, one of the first things we did after we got married, we want a TV. We go to Sears. We get a loan. What was the interest rate? 27%. You know? And then we think, oh, well, we can do that. Well, now, let's, now we can do this. And let's go buy a car. And let's, you know, you just do all that. And then you do reconsolidations and the consequences. It just, you don't learn from that. You just someday wake up. <laughs> it's not a learning. It's just waking up and say, this is not the way to go. The way to go is we just, we listen to the voice of wisdom. And the voice of wisdom says, you don't need that right now. Wait and save some money where you can pay cash. So it's just like the prodigal son. Uh, and I, I know I'm reviewing some, but we need to hear it. It's good to hear things over and over. But the prodigal son, after he had left his dad, spent everything that he had, 
And then uh, I like what Kay said. He probably wrote a whole big page on how to apologize. You know, I was wrong. You know, I was stupid and all this stuff. And he was ready to come back and apologize to his daddy and say, can I just be a servant? And he didn't even get a chance to do it. You know why? Because his dad embraced him. See, Sandy, we've got to let God embrace us just as you are. That song that we used to sing, Come Just As You Are, but they lied to him. Instead of come as you are, then they came and they started saying, now you did wrong and you've done wrong and you need to fix your hair and you need to change this. And you know, but No, just come as you are and let the love of God embrace you. I say this to people about our fellowship. Come as you are. And we're, my people will love you. My family, not my people, but my, my family will love you. We have people here that just will embrace you and love you right where you are. And not try to change you because you don't need to be changed. You just need to wake up. When you wake up, then that's you start living the life. When you wake up, you begin to see it upon you. I mean, I've seen people over the years that woke up to some things. Literally, one of them was the Pierces, Ralph and Wilma, right here. When they came here, when Donna the first time, and Ralph began to hear the, the, the finished work of Jesus Christ, you should have seen the picture of him before and the picture of him about six months later, literally, it changed his countenance. And he called me a uh, day before yesterday and told me, he said, that's the greatest message I ever heard in my life. He said, it changed my life. I said, well, you, you want some more change? <laughs> Here's more to hear. So what is his love? His love is forever and forever and forever, and it's always poured out on man. It's always available for us. There was a sign down the street we passed a little while ago said, God's love is free. Why don't you open the package? <laughs> so he embraced the prodigal. That embracing, see, it, it wasn't to change the father's heart. It was to let the boy know that he was always loved. Now Hebrews 10, 26 again. If we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice. So who is the we that he's talking about? It wasn't you and me. The people living in the sacrificial That's system. That's right. It was the people that were in the sacrificial system. It was, before, it was before the cross. And so it was the Hebrews who were, were hoodwinked, if you were, uh, were. They were deceived by the judicial, the judicial system of sacrifice theology the we today are the ones who are deceived by the religious system in this earth today. See, Paul wrote this to those people, but he wrote it for us. Because God knew that there would be generation after generation after generation. It takes a long time to get a lifetime of upbringing out of you. It takes a long time to get condemnation and guilt, self-condemnation and guilt out of a person's life. You know, we, we know a man today that he feels guilty of, about something and he feels shame about something and that's his enemy because he shouldn't. He's, the, the, what we know of him, he's done everything to do to bless the people that he felt like he hurt. There was a divorce involved, so he feels guilty about leaving his wife. He feels, But what we know about him, he's just poured all kinds of blessings on them, and, but he still has that guilt and condemnation and shame, and that's your enemy. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. So we, we, we want to help people. Uh, so you need this redefining of judgment yourself. Every individual person does, because there's still this mindset that God is going to do something. Now in verse 26, it continues, it says, there remaineth no sacrifice for sin. So what did they no longer have why did they no longer have to sacrifice anything? Because Jesus was the final sacrifice, but it wasn't for God, it was for man. Jesus, see, and he talks about this in Hebrews. He, he said the, the priests of the Old Testament time had to sacrifice every year. So it wasn't a forever sacrifice, was it? It, it, wouldn't, it wasn't enough. You just had to keep bringing more and more and more. But then he comes along and explains, and he says, but Jesus was enough. Jesus, for you, not for God, not for God, but you've got to realize that Jesus, what he did is he ended that sacrificial system, and you, you should have seen what happened there. It's enough. You never have to do anything like this again. God does not want it. 
So I wrote here this morning uh, that uh, what they did, they know, God, God said to them, I paraphrase it, God said, you think you need a sacrifice? I'll be the once and for all sacrifice in my son. Please don't do this anymore. I don't want your sacrifice from you. I just want your love. And I just want to love you. I want to shine my love. Don't do it anymore. What's that counseling thing we heard? Just stop it. Well, what do we have to do, God? Just stop it. Stop saying, what do you have to do? You know, I've heard people say, what do I have to do to get God to heal me? What do I have to do? What do I have to do? You don't have to do anything. That's your problem. You thinking you have to do something is holding back the life of God inside of you. It's self-condemnation. You feel condemned. You feel like you have to appease what you've done, and you don't have to. Now, you know, I can hear people again say, well, pastor, you're giving people a license to go out and do stuff and not feel guilty. No, I'm not doing that. People are going to feel guilty on their own if they go do something that doesn't represent who they are. What I'm telling you, though, is it doesn't change who you are, but there are consequences to it, and it does affect other people. I've got a Facebook connection, and I kind of like to say he's my friend. We haven't talked a lot, but he's over in, in, in London area, or where we're over there, and there was a murderer that's caught that's done all kinds of horrible killings. And uh, one of them was a child, and he never told them the family where the child was, you know, and they needed that closure. And, and his dying breath, they couldn't understand why he wouldn't say, this is where your child's at. And people were condemning him and condemning him. And one guy was saying how he's going to burn in hell, or is burning in hell. And I just wrote back, he had his own hell, and he, he uh, affected other people with his own hell. So that, that's why we, we, we want to get to the place where we wake up to who we are, where we quit doing that kind of stuff. Because it doesn't just affect you, it affects everybody. You know? <laughs> I could say I can eat all the ice cream I want, but you know what? If I do, it's going to affect my wife, it's going to affect my children. I, I could get sick, I could get, I could get where I couldn't work, or I could die. Or I could cause other people to die getting in the way of my ice cream. <laughs> I can't imagine what it's like for people to watch this and they're saying, what is he talking about ice cream so much for? I need to quit it because I tell you, I've been desiring it a lot lately. Yeah, I've probably had about four or five ice cream cones in the last three weeks. Uh, <laughs> now you had birthday this week. That's right, I deserve it. So, so people read this, there remaineth no more sacrifice and preachers get on soapboxes and say, if you sin willfully, there's nothing left for you, you're doomed. And there are people all over the place in the world that feel like there's no hope for them anymore. They, they don't go to church anymore because that's all they hear is there's no hope for you. They get on drugs. They get on all kinds of stuff to bring in peace because they have no peace, right? They have no hope. They're taking their hope away. Well, Paul was trying to give them hope, not take it away. Jesus came to give us hope, not take it away. Our hope is in him. Our hope is in what he did. Our hope is in the love of God. I don't hope for anything anymore. I have the love of God. I know the love of God. I know the grace of God. I know the mercy of God. It's not, it's not that he's given me something just because I don't deserve it. I know that he's never wanted to punish me. So that this is none of us who, who we, we, we willingly commit side slips all the time. Probably will for a long time. Hopefully we'll get to where we don't because... I get tired of the consequences of it. You know, I slip up and eat too much ice cream. Next thing you know, my 36 pants have to come way down here now. I can't get it up here anymore. There's consequences to it. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with there needing to be a sacrifice whatsoever. Let me skip ahead here just a little bit. So, Hebrews, let's look at Hebrews 10.10. 10. 10, 14, 10, 18. We, we visited that a week or so ago, but we want to do it some more, and we'll probably do it a little bit more in the future. So, so what are we saying again? I'm not saying stop sinning. I'm not saying stop doing anything. I'm saying stop believing you have to do something to please God. Yeah. Just, huh? It sounds funny? Yeah, Kay, Kay will like that if she heard you say Kay Fairchild says she loves hearing Donna talk back to me. <laughs> it does say fun, because you can't stop it on your own. 
What will stop it is when you find out the love of God. When you find out there, there, there therefore is no condemnation. There is no condemnation. Because you're, you're talking about your, your uh, relationship with God. When you're, when you're worried because you've done something wrong, you're more worried about your relationship with God. But your relationship with God is sure. You know, so you just come and you just feed and you feed and you just enjoy the love of the Father, you enjoy the love of one another, and you will eventually get what you need from the Father and from one another. See, the Father flows through us. People are always asking God to do something. God does things through people. We're here. We're the Christ in this earth. That's why we are to be willing to bless people. You know, uh, I've never had money come floating out of heaven anywhere, but I've had people hand me money. I've won prizes from my company. I've won money from my company. It always comes that way. Uh, I, I've never actually had God up there. This is going to be hard for people, but I've never had God up there somewhere do something for me down here. I've never had God say, go bless Roy or go heal Roy or go give Roy a bucket of money or, or whatever. I've had God move through people. Is that not the truth? Every blessing that I've ever received is through people. And I believe, I believe in healing, but I believe it's not perfect. I believe in miracles, but I believe it's not perfect. I want permanence. But I have, got, I have had God heal through people ministering to me, laying hands on me, and stirring up my faith and helping me tap in. And I've seen a miracle. I've seen a lady, you know, I haven't seen a lot of miracles. I don't know how many of you have, but I've seen Margetta Howe instantly heal of, of um, what's it called, Donna? Cerebral palsy. Cerebral, no. MS. MS, yeah. Muscular sclerosis. Completely healed of it. Get out of a wheelchair. That was God working through a man. God didn't say, Margetta, I'm going to heal you right now. God said, go to Pastor Hibbert Sunday morning and say, God told me that when you lay hands on me that I am going to be healed. Now, why didn't God just heal her right there? Because God wants to work through men. God is not a God that's sitting on a throne somewhere saying, do this, do this, do that. He works through men. So he spoke in her spirit and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a picture. And we should have seen that. And Brother Hibbard said that I didn't feel nothing. I mean, standing in front of a church of probably 250 people or more on Southwestern. And he said, all right, if God said it, I'm going to do it. You know, and he laid hands on her and spoke healing to come forth out of her, and she jumped up and ran and talked, and it was, it was a marvelous experience for me to see, probably 13, 14 years old. And I'll never, ever forget that, but she died of a horrible disease years later. Years later. Because we, and I, I think the reason why is because we're always depending on a healing, and if you're always depending on the healing, you will go to your grave depending on a healing, depending on a miracle. So God wants to work through us today, and he's bringing us messengers today that can teach us how to live out of the permanence of life, right? Permanent life. And we do that again by loving our Father, loving one another, not letting any condemnation come in to the point that I would think that I don't deserve a healing. You know, we have a sister that's got COPD. You don't think that she has stuff come to her brain all the time? I did this to myself. She does. I know she does. And because I, I do it too, we all do it to ourselves. So that's that self condemnation that literally can rob us from receiving because we don't feel worthy to. I know God loves me, but I did this to myself. And that's a war. That's a war that we must destroy with the truth. We must continue to meditate on teaching. There's nothing can separate us from the love of God. And what was the love of God? That he came to man when man was in their worst shape. And I'm going to re redefine worst shape. In other words, they had a false understanding of him. They believed that they needed to sacrifice him. Not that they were dirty, rotten sinners or anything, but the very worst shape is where you think that God can hate you. That God can condemn you. That God can burn you forever. That's bad shape. And he came to them and said, listen, guys, I never asked you to do this. He did that in his son. He talked to his son. I never asked you to do this. I just want to love you. I've had times in my life where I've done things for people and they misunderstood it. And I've just tried and tried to say, I'm doing this because I love you. I'm wanting to help you. I'm not trying to interfere in your life. I just, I just love to help people. 
but some people can't, they don't get it, right? So let's look at these verses again. Hebrew 10, 10, Hebrews 10, 10, by the which we are, and that's past tense, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now, a lot of people can look at that and think we weren't sanctified, but that really is saying the realization of that is true. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, there should have been a realization come that we're already holy and we're already set apart and we never lost that. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So one of them said that we're sanctified through it, but then the other one says, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. They already were sanctified, but he's perfecting you. In other words, he's making you more able to live out of that. The perfection is your awareness, if you would. Verse 18, now for, re for remission, which means freedom, of these is, which means stands, there is no more offering for sin. So in other words, when you understand it, you won't do any more offering for anything that you do. There's no need for it. That's what that means to say. There's no need for it. So is that not what Paul wrote in verse 26? There remains no more offering for what you call sin because Jesus' passion did it into that sacrificial system. And it's been over 2017 years uh, of Jesus ending this mythological idea and every religion of the cosmos system is still offering all kinds of stuff of all sorts, right? And they're saying that if you'll send money in, they still do it on TV. I laugh at some of those old TV shows that were on when I was a child and they're still saying the same, same thing. And they'll sell you this bottle of witch's brew that you can put on. That's what I call it, witch's brew. Restless people. And they'll sell you this bottle. They'll do this. They'll everything in the world to get your money to make you think that you're going to please God or God's going to do something through this for you. They're still taught that stuff. So the Apostle Paul is not agreeing with verse 26 through 31. He's saying the very opposite. Yes. The very opposite of it. They believed God needed appeasement. He's saying God never needed appeasement whatsoever. They carried all this over into their life of a God of blessing and cursing. Even we can look at the... Uh, and I can't wait to look at it, but when the ark landed on Mount Ariad, y'all remember what that name means? Curses the, reversed. the curse is reversed. So that implied to us that God cursed the people. But it's not. It's the curse they brought on themselves. It's a picture that Jesus, the ark, is going to go into that false belief system of being cursed and needing to appease God, and he's going to reverse that and he's going to bring, bring us we're all the way back to the original where we knew nothing but the love of God. Where Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Sandy, can you remember ever walking with Rod in a beautiful, cool, beautiful day? And it's just so nice and love is just coming out of you. Rod looks at you and you can see hearts popping out of his head. There's flowers all over you. <laughs> She's just shaking her head. Yes, all the time. That, to me, that's the cool of the day. Uh, I got up uh, yesterday morning. Oh my gosh, it was so cool. It was calm after the storm was all over with. It felt really good. That was, but I'm telling you, can you imagine in the reality what the cool, the spirit, walking in the spirit? We used to sing a song like that, walking in the spirit, you know, but it was always shaking off the dust. But I don't have any dust to shake off. I'm just walking in the spirit. That's what, that is life and life more abundantly. That's where you say, don't you wish we could just stay here all the time? We can't. That's what Paul's trying to help these people do. Your relationship with God was that of a God of blessing and cursing. I'm telling you, there is no cursing whatsoever. So here's what it produced again, verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries, which is people. And so what that really says in the King James Version, what King James Ver uh, the New King James Version, and I like it, it says, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. So there we go. Same thing as to suppose you're expecting judgment and a fiery indignation which will devour people. And that's what religion taught us. Yeah. You keep this up, there's going to be a day that you're going to face judgment. You're going to have to stand before God. Man, I, how many times we heard it? You're going to have to stand before God and answer for everything that you ever did. People believe that. They call it the great white throne judgment. And they're going to, I mean, 
It's crazy. But he said, that's your expectation. It's your fear. Your expectation is not true. Your expectation came from mythological and paganistic belief systems. Our expectation in our generation came from a religious church, did it not? Came from what our parents taught us. So it's vital to understand Paul was saying this is not at all what Father God is like. And boy, will they hang you for trying to say that. I tell people in their homes all the time, God is not mad. God's not angry. And they just look at you like, what tree did you fall off from, boy? And they'll say, you mean you don't believe in this? You don't believe in hell? You don't believe in punishment? Nope. I put all my faith in my Father. I believe in God who is love, not an angry God. So verse 27 reveals just what people's awareness is that believe in penal substitution. And they believe in a God that was mad, and because he was mad, he killed his own son. That used to really bother me when people would say, well, do you believe God killed his own son? And I will know God didn't kill his son, he killed Adam. God, it, Jesus became, you know, and that's what we used to teach to make it sound nicer, you know. But God didn't kill his son. His son willingly went. In, in, and God was in him. How can, you know, God was in Jesus reconciling the world back to waking up to who they are. Not because they were separated from, the, uh, from God himself, but they, they're in their understanding they separated themselves. They had a strong sense of separation. And he was bringing reconciliation as a, an accounting term. So that you can go through all these places, the Old Testament, everything, and we can see these stories like, you know, like Sodom and Gomorrah and add it up and find out they brought their own judgment upon themselves. All through there. What did we talk about last week with Ananias and Sapphira? You know, I, I, I couldn't wrap my head around that, man. Did God kill him? Well, no, God didn't kill him because God's love. And I, and I teach that there's no such judgment. Well, then the disciples had the power to kill him. No, they didn't have the power to kill somebody. I, I can't just kill you by talking to you, but I can produce a fear in your life that you receive that fear, and that fear will kill you, right? It causes heart attacks. It causes strokes. All kinds of things that can take place in a perfectly healthy body when a person is consumed with fear and an unsurety of life. And we talked about that last week when people drop dead at funerals all the time when their spouses are buried. It's, it's a terrible situation. So the much more of Jesus is by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Once and for all, we're sanctified. Once and for all, we're awakened to the fact that we were born holy, and we were always holy, and we were always righteous, and we didn't have to get anything, do anything to get that. When I was born from my mama's womb, I was a rich man. There's nothing I had to do to become a rich man. I was a rich man. How much more than when we were created by our father, we were placed in our mother's womb, the egg was in there, or dad's sperm came in there, and a supernatural thing took place, and I really like this. They say when that sperm hits that egg, there's a flash of light. That I've seen a picture of it on the internet. A flash of light takes place, and I believe that's a quickening of the spirit takes place in that, that, that being. It's sad to me that people don't even believe in spirit. They just think we're like no different than animals. It's ridiculous. So when people fight for the right to believe that God killed Jesus, uh, they're creating fear. I mean, if, how many times have you heard a preacher say, if God did this to his son, what will he do to you? I won't tell the whole story, but there was a story about a little kid that was going to go to an orphanage, I think, or Catholic school or whatever, and he, and he ran away. He got very fearful, and they got him, and they said, well, what's wrong? He said, well, I saw what they did to that other boy, and Jesus was hanging, you know, they had Jesus hanging on the cross, and that, that scared him to death. I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't doubt why people are so terrified when they go to church. They cause you to expect that, and it's not true. So the only reason man has been destroyed on earth today is that especially the leaders are teaching a, teach system, a, a, teaching a system that produces fear where over and over and over God said fear not. 
read them. It's like, I think I told you all, there was like a hundred and something, 167, I forget what I wrote in the, here, but where it says, fear not, fear not, fear not. God's always saying, fear not, fear not. And what did the religious system teach, Sandy? Fear, fear, fear. If you don't give enough, fear. If you don't do enough, fear. If you mess up, fear. If you see the wrong thing, fear. It's all based on fear, and it's not based on the love of God. And the love of God, I tell you, the love of God constrains us. You know what the systems of this earth want? Their major thing is uh, they don't love God because they don't know the real, true, and living God. They don't love people. They love power, and they love control, and they love money. And I don't say all people in the, but I believe the, the people who are running the government, who are really running the government, love power and love money. I believe the people who are really running the medical industry love power and they love money. I believe the people who are really running the, med the financial, uh, financial systems of this earth, they're after power and they're after money. And the social realms after power and after money. Who, who's, who affects this social realm, family? Hollywood. T t the television industry, what you watch all the time affects you. I told Donna that, that we saw an advertisement for a movie yesterday, and I said, you know, I, I think the world looks at those stupid movies and they think that's who we really are. I just want to get on Facebook and say, don't believe Hollywood. That's not who we are. That's actors. They're hypocrites. They're pretending to be somebody that they're not, and they're trying to make you think that that's who we are. And they do some of the stupidest stuff. You know, so they're, they're after the love of power and love of money and not the love of God and the love of people. We need to love people. And if you're working in a corporation, if you're working in any of these industries, you need to let the Father shine the love of God upon you so you can love the people and love God. That's when things are going to come together. That's when planet, the whole planet, not just the United States, but the whole planet will come together when people start loving one another. And realizing that God has no desires whatsoever for sacrifice. Amen? Amen? It's the love of God that constrains you. Well, pastor, can't you cast it out of me? <laughs> you know, can't you, can't, you, can't you deliver me? Can't you? No, it's the love of God. I preach the love of God. I'm not going to push you down, blow on you, knock you down, make you throw up in a bag. I'm not going to make you say ten Hail Marys or, or you know, uh, come fast all night long or... Or, you know, whatever it is, I'm just going to teach you the love of God. And the love of God is what's going to constrain you. And what I mean constrain you is hold you back from doing things that are harmful to you and harmful to the brethren. Amen? Amen. There's nothing like the love of God. Amen. And I don't even think we totally understand it yet, but it's, it's so far, it's so big, it's so wide. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, it's, the universe can't even contain the love of God. It's so big for all of us. Amen? Amen. I hope you like that. God bless you. Appreciate you. Those on Facebook, thank you for the happy birthday wishes. My wife told me there was a lot, but I can't see them anywhere on my Facebook page. I know there were thousands of them, though, but for some reason or another, they're blocked from my page. So, <laughs> But I appreciate you, and uh, uh, I, I can't wait to teach next week. It's just getting better and better. So, God bless you. Thank you. Well, that's about time. <laughs> Get a standing ovation. <laughs>